Hello there. In this recording, we finish up our conversation about the insanity defense, and as well, we finish up our conversation about defenses. So we've already explored the various tests for the insanity defense that we saw set forth in the Johnson case. So we know there are four of those, and the majority test is the McNaughton standard, all right? which was developed in England under common law, transplanted here to the United States, uh, and today remains the majority approach of many jurisdictions that allow for the insanity defense. And we have also taken a look at the model penal codes approach, which uh, adopts the or endorses the McNaughton version of the insanity test, but then also includes the irresistible impulse test. All right, so the model penal code is an amalgamation of the McNaughton test, the majority test, and as well, the irresistible impulse or the control test. In both the McNaughton test and in the model penal code test, we're concerned at times with whether or not the defendant uh, lacks knowledge of the wrongfulness of the act as set forth in the McNaughton standard or under the model penal code, lacks substantial, excuse me, lacks substantial capacity to appreciate the criminality or wrongfulness of his conduct. So we see that at least in two tests, we're concerned with the meaning of wrongfulness. And so this is our chance to take a look at that term as used in insanity defense statutes. Uh, and as well understand that uh, depending on the individual's mental illness, this can be quite a difficult concept to bear it out, whether or not the defendant uh, understands or is aware of the wrongfulness of their actions. And so in this particular conversation, we explore the concept of wrongfulness in the Wilson case and the Yates case. So in the Wilson case, we're dealing with a defendant who suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, which as we'll see includes as a symptom delusions. If you're not at all familiar with paranoid schizophrenia or uh, any of the symptoms um, or any of the particular behaviors. And if you're not familiar with whether that means an individual can uh, in any sort of way carry out a full and ordinary life, the answer is yes. Uh, you might be familiar with one of the most famous individuals that we know to have paranoid schizophrenia. If you take a look at the first slide, John Nash Jr. Uh, was a famous American mathematician. Uh, he is the winner of a Nobel Prize in economics, um, but throughout his life, he struggled with paranoid schizophrenia. And uh, it was this experience as well as his successes which led to the writing of the book, A Beautiful Mind, and then subsequently the movie related to him as well. He died in 2015 in a car crash uh, with his wife, um, alongside him, uh, and he was in his 80s at the time. The other case we'll take a look at is the Yates case. Um, and the Yates case is a well-known, high-profile case involving postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, and a mother's murder of her four children. So some of you may already have been well aware of this case before today's lecture or before you prepared for today's lecture. So first, the Wilson case. Next slide. Wilson, as mentioned and as you've read, uh, has been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. If you take a look at the PowerPoint, you will see a description of the illness um, as set forth in the DSM-4 and DSM-5. If you're not familiar with the DSM-4 and the DSM-5, uh, DSM refers to the Diagnostic and Statistics excuse me, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is a manual that psychiatrists and psychologists use to uh, diagnose uh, individuals with uh, mental illness or mental other mental health problems. Uh, it is now in its fifth edition, hence DSM-5. But what is set forth here in the PowerPoint reflects the DSM-4 approach to schizophrenia, which divided it into subtypes, and then a change to the next edition of DSM-5, which collected all of the types of schizophrenia uh, into one diagnosis and created a spectrum, uh, so to speak. 
But in any event, if you're not very familiar with paranoid schizophrenia, here are uh, some of the symptoms and a little bit of description about the condition. So again, in Wilson, the defendant has been diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, uh, and he believed that the victim in the case was doing him and all of society wrong, and thus the defendant needed to eliminate him from society. And the way in which the defendant eliminated the victim from society was by killing him. After the defendant uh, killed the victim, he turned himself into the police and he confessed to the killing. The case goes to trial, and at trial, the defendant puts forth an insanity defense, and the jury ultimately rejects that defense and convicts him, and he appeals. And he appeals, arguing that the trial court improperly instructed the jury as to the meaning of the term wrongfulness in that jurisdiction's insanity statute. Next slide. Note that the jurisdiction's insanity statute was based on the model penal code, uh, and uh, more specifically, note that the jurisdiction had elected to use the term wrongfulness rather than criminality. As I mentioned in the last audio recording, the model penal code um, uh, includes criminality as the primary recommended language, but also offers the alternative that jurisdictions can use the concept of wrongfulness if they so choose. So an individual lacks substantial capacity to appreciate the criminality of the conduct, or a jurisdiction could elect to use the language lack of substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of conduct. All right, and so in this particular jurisdiction, the legislature had elected to use the term wrongfulness. And so as a matter of st statutory construction, the legislature um, was understood to um, view wrongfulness as a matter of moral wrong rather than legal wrong or criminal wrong. All right. So the defendant, however, argued that wrongfulness meant that if the defendant's mental disease or defect resulted in him personally or subjectively believing he was morally justified in the killing, then he was insane. And it wouldn't matter whether or not the defendant knew society would morally disapprove of his conduct or deem his conduct unlawful. All right, so the jurisdiction adopted the term wrongfulness rather than criminality. And this, as a matter of statutory construction, was understood to be a moral wrong or moral wrongfulness rather than legal wrong. And so the defendant had to argue about what that would mean in light of the defendant's or a defendant's mental disease or defect. And so here, the defendant put forth a definition that was a purely subjective definition based on whether or not the defendant believed he was morally justified in the killing, regardless of whether society would approve or disapprove, or whether the defendant knew society would approve or disapprove. The government, on the other hand, argued that wrongfulness meant that if the defendant failed to appreciate society's moral standards, then he was insane. In other words, if the defendant knew his conduct was illegal, then he appreciated society's moral standards and he was not insane. So in this case, the government would say that the defendant, even though he was deluded because of his paranoid schizophrenia, he knew society would not condone his conduct, but he chose to act anyway on the basis of personal beliefs. Thus, he was sane. All right, so essentially the parties are at opposite ends of the spectrum, as we've seen quite commonly before. And also, as we've seen quite commonly, the court adopts a compromise definition. So a defendant may establish that he lacked substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct if he can prove that at the time of his criminal act, as a result of mental disease or defect, the defendant substantially misperceived reality and harbored an illusional belief that society under the circumstances as the defendant honestly, but mistakenly understood them, would not have morally condemned his actions. All right, even if he understood that society would make it illegal. So in other words, a defendant under the standards set forth by the court in Wilson would be entitled to prevail on an insanity defense if as a result of his mental disease or defect, he sincerely or genuinely 
believes that the, that society would approve of his conduct if it shared his understanding of the circumstances underlying his actions. All right, so this is a bit of a compromise, right? We look at what the defendant subjectively, sin um, genuinely, sincerely believes, and whether that is that society would approve of his conduct if it knew what he knew. All right, so I'm going to say it. I've said it almost every time we've talked about a different crime and defense in the last few weeks. This is a bit of a subjective, objective standard. So we are considering his subjective, subjective beliefs, but we are also then considering how society would view his beliefs. Under the new formulation of the test, the defendant, Wilson, had produced enough evidence to present his insanity defense to the jury. That is, there was sufficient evidence that the jury could conclude that he was deluded. He believed the victim posed a harm to society. He knew society would not condone his killing, criminally or morally, but because of his delusion, he thought society did not understand the harm posed by the victim. And if society knew the truth, as he thought it to be, about the harm posed by the victim, then society would conclude it was acceptable to kill the victim. Right? So on the one hand, the defendant knew that society would not condone killing a victim, but he thought society did not understand the harm and that if society actually knew the harm the victim posed, then it would approve of the killing. All right, so in the Wilson case, we see how, um, one, courts interpret wrongfulness, particularly, um, two, in light of uh, some individuals having delusions or um, hallucinations or more broadly, their mental illness affects their understanding of wrongfulness, even if maybe they understand the criminality or illegality of their conduct. Okay, so having understood that basic doctrine set forth in Wilson for individuals who are operating under delusions, the question becomes, well, how do we apply this standard to the McNaughton test or the Model Penal Code test, and in particular, the facts of the Andrea Yates case when analyzed under those tests? So next slide. So the way your text has set this up is to consider Andrea Yates' case in light of the Wilson standard and the uh, earlier various tests that we've looked at for legal insanity. So in this PowerPoint, um, what you see on your top left is a picture of Andrea Yates, her husband, and their five children. On the bottom left is a picture of the home in which she lived with her family and in which she uh, killed her children by drowning them. On the top right is a picture of her, of her being escorted into court shortly after the, um, the killings. And then bottom right is her at trial with her defense attorney. So um, if you were not familiar with this case uh, beforehand, you are certainly now based on the information uh, in the court opinion, as well as the notes after the case. Uh, these pictures are some of the most common pictures you will see related to the case. Uh, they continually appear in media reports, even to this day, uh, over a decade later. Next slide. So, um, this case, as uh, you read, uh, involves allegations that um, uh, Yates suffered from postpartum depression as well. She was given other diagnoses, um, but postpartum depression as a mental illness is a, um, uh, a scenario that many in the general public uh, have questions about and or concerns or critiques about, right? Um, it is not uncommon that women who have recently given birth experience so-called baby blues after giving birth so many women uh, and many families and individuals are familiar with that. But the notion that it would rise to a diagnosable uh, mental illness, such as postpartum depression, or even postpartum psychosis, which was claimed uh, here uh, in Yates's case, um, is just virtually unthinkable to many, uh, particularly when you couple that with a mother ultimately killing her children. So this was a significant both uh, medical debate and cultural debate 
alongside the legal debate. Uh, is it a real thing, so to speak? So this PowerPoint sets forth for you some of the medical information about the condition, about uh, the symptoms, um, who might be at risk for postpartum depression or at the extreme postpartum psychosis, uh, and how you distinguish postpartum or peripartum depression from the maybe more common baby blues. All right, so this information you can use to inform your thinking uh, as well about this particular case. So what I would ask of you now is um, to think about how you would analyze uh, Andrea Yates' insanity claims under the McNaughton test and the model penal code test. Next slide. All right, so if you used either of those tests, um, the McNaughton or the model penal code test, right, what do you think the analysis would be from the defendant's perspective? Uh, what would be the argument that she is legally insane? Uh, would the outcomes differ under the varying tests? And remember, there are multiple prongs in each of those tests. So we're not just looking at the different tests, we're looking at um, uh, the different prongs within the test and how the analysis might uh, vary and how the outcomes might vary depending on what standard we're looking at. So you have the facts in your opinion, the notes as I've mentioned. I have also posted on uh, Twen a link to a video of uh, Yates's interview approximately one month after the killings. About one month after the killings, she um, had uh, some mental health psychiatric evaluations and um, there is a link on Twin that provides you a little bit of that interview so you can see uh, real time back then her demeanor and how she was responding to questions and what questions she was asked. So you can also use that to inform your thinking. You can use the information in the PowerPoint about postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis um, to uh, consider your analysis. So if you haven't looked up this case yet or if you're not familiar with this case, uh, I will give you a little bit of a spoiler alert, right, that um, she was tried and the first time the jury returned a verdict of guilty, uh, did not impose a death penalty, sentenced her to life in prison. Uh, she appealed her conviction and that conviction was reversed. Uh, you can look it up uh, on your own to find out why it was reversed. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that maybe you wonder what happened there with the prosecutor or the prosecution's experts. How did they sort of mess that up, but look it up to see what was ultimately the basis for the reversal. And then she was retried. And in the retrial, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. And as a matter of preclusion, because she had already been tried the first time, the jury did not return um, a, a sentence of death. The government um, was precluded from seeking the death penalty in the second case. Uh, and so after the not guilty by reason of, of insanity verdict, she was committed to a state mental health facility. Uh, and in fact, it's the Carville um, State Hospital that you see pictured here in the PowerPoint slide. Uh, and she remains there to uh, this day. And so um, just last thing for you to do after you've done your analysis and maybe look up a little bit about more about the case, um, uh, I have also posted on Twin a link to a video which describes her life now. Um, what is her life now more than 15 years later as she remains in the Kerrville State Hospital? Uh, and then that concludes our discussion of the insanity defense. Uh, I will also tell you that I posted on Twin uh, a, a PS video for the Hinckley uh, case, which we talked about last recording. Uh, this is a video which talks about essentially where Hinckley is now and how his life is now. Uh, so um, you can check that out on Twin as well. All right, so I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions and comments on uh, the insanity defense, in particular wrongfulness in light of Wilson and how you might analyze the Andrea Yates case. And I'm happy to take more questions uh, generally. Um, uh, you may have questions on other cases about women who kill uh, their children. It is certainly a rare uh, event, but it is not one um, that is difficult to find cases concerning, sadly.
All right, so that's the end of our discussion of the insanity defense and as well defenses overall. Take care.